This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. This is your host, Paul Carr, and with me today is astronaut teacher Mike Mongo. Hey, hey Paul. Hi, Mike. So, today is a special episode focused on the past and the future of the WOW Signal podcast, what we'd like to achieve, and what the team envisions for the next year or so of the content of the podcast. So... Let me start by telling you some of the goals that we have and where we are. We we are in the middle of season two. I think we have several more episodes to go before we are uh, ready to wrap up that season. We have begun a new feature called the Wow Signal Burst, which is on the same feed as the as the regular episodes. These are short five to ten minute episodes. Well, one was 12, but generally speaking, five to 10 minutes. And they'll be hopefully out much more often. It'll be a very focused episode on a particular single topic. And we have three of those out so far, and we'd love your feedback. So let me talk about some of the things that I, that I want to accomplish now. We are currently sitting at point where we get about 900 to 1,000, maybe more than 1,000 downloads for every episode eventually. It takes a few months for that many downloads to accrue. So if you figure from that, we're probably getting anywhere from 500 to close to 1,000 listens per episode. We'd like to grow that audience a lot, and then over the next year, I'd like to get to where we're more or less about a thousand to two thousand listens per episode, and then not, and it will vary because not every so every episode is going to be as popular as every other one. Each one will be covering a broad topic area, and not everybody finds every topic fascinating. That's fine. Right now, we have on the team we have there there are five of us: myself, Mike Mongo, who's with us. Right now, James Garrison, who may join us later, and also Tim Jones in the UK and Jim Cavera. Of the five of us, I would like everyone on the team to produce at least one wow signal burst or even a full episode uh, without any help from me, except maybe, you know, I do a little bit of, uh, of administrivia at the end. And then together, the five of us produce at least 12 full episodes and about an equal number of bursts in 2015. Uh, so far, I think we're on track for that. We want to have a run of episodes that top a thousand downloads in their first six months. We have, uh, so far, we have, I believe, six episodes that have topped a thousand. Very important. I want to get real engagement in the online community. And I'm looking for ideas about how we can do that. We have, at present, we have a Google Plus community. And we have a subreddit. Uh, we have a little bit of activity in the Google Plus community. Uh, the subreddit is a ghost town. So I really would like to see a lot more people come in and contribute their thoughts, their ideas, their recommendations, their suggestions about e- either specific topics that we are covering on the Wow Signal or about the podcast in general, how we can make it better and how we can improve the way we do things and also how we can grow the community. So please come in. 
and and if you know if we need to have a, a a group on Facebook or something like that that you would be more likely to participate in, let, let us know. Another thing is the podcast is supported by patrons on Patreon, and my goal is by the end of 2015 to have at least 10 patrons on Patreon. More is fine. Uh, we're talking about maybe some people who are pledging at maybe the one to two dollar per episode level. We're not I'm talking about big spenders here. Not that you're discouraged from pledging more, but that would be that would be great to get to be getting about ten to twenty dollars per episode would pay pretty much all the costs of the of the podcast. If we get more money than that, I promise you we will use it to do things like attend conferences or buy better equipment and so on. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that I, I have reestablished uh, the page on the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com that says we want one more member on the team. So that would bring us up to six people. Um, if you think you might be the right person for that, please read the blog page that in Wow Signal Podcast that, where it says co-host wanted. Read that. Read the whole thing and let me know if you think you're the right person for that. Uh, or if you know someone who might be the right person for that. Now, what's coming up in terms of topics? I've just gotten a couple of very distinguished scientists to agree to sit down with me in about a week to talk about Venus exploration. And I'll let them talk as long as they want to on that topic and hopefully get them discussing with each other as well. That's that's a hot topic now with the recent NASA Langley report on how we could build a human-occupied colony or uh, science station in the atmosphere of Venus. This is not the first time anyone's thought about sending people to Venus or sending balloons to, to fly in the atmosphere of Venus. There have been previous work done on that, and these two guys are both been involved in that work. So, And I'm also trying to get someone from NASA Langley to join us on that, so that should be fun. And that'll be out before the end of January. Is the is the Venus stuff the Venera stuff? Venera? No, that was a Soviet mission. Yeah, the Venera. I thought you said that we that these guys worked with. They worked on Venus exploration architectures. Uh, oh, got it. And, and right. are and are still doing so. So far, what's been done is there there were some Soviet landers. That landed on yeah, the, those yeah. are awesome. There have also been several several spacecraft that have orbited Venus, um, including the one that I think just there were sixteen. I think there were sixteen of those of those. I mean, at least there was at least thirteen of those Soviet Venera probes, and at least three of them landed successfully, as I recall, before melting in, in a very short order. But they, but we actually have pictures from the surface of venus which to me just blows my mind yes we do have that and now the problem is those those landers didn't survive very long yeah did you see that thing did you see last week the story that came, that was really popular on the internet about the the venus colonies that are that are moons uh, excuse me that are balloons yes that that's what we'll be talking about that plus we'll be talking about some previous work that's been done on venus balloons um and Venus arch- Venus mission architectures, including rovers. Um, you may think a Venus rover is impossible, but uh, some people have taken on that task, and they had they came up with some interesting results. And so we're we'll talking to one of the guys who who led that that effort, as well as uh, someone who's been involved in Venus. I'm not going to announce their names just yet because uh, I haven't got it in the can. It's not but, confirmed. Not yeah. For, but uh, yeah, we are going to we're going to cover Venus exploration, something we haven't really talked about at all yet. Um, the other, I mean, a lot of people don't even talk about Venus exploration because it's so hot, and they don't even people don't think most people. In fact, most people don't realize that we've sent and landed probes that have sent images back from Venus to Earth. That's true. People are not aware of that. Yeah, and and so when we talk about Venus, everybody thinks Venus is so hot that there's no way we're going to put probes or colonies or landers or anything on Venus. But in fact, we've already had some success with Venus. Yeah. If you just look at, uh, you just go to Wikipedia and type Venera, you'll, you'll get the story there. Find awesome stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's super cool. Uh, from 19, let's see, the first probes were developed between 1961 and 1984. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah. Now, um, 
what they're talking about, the rovers is a very long lifed rover that would actually move around the surface and do science on the surface. Um, that would be, wow. that would be a, uh, that the engineer, that's an engineering feat that's very difficult, but uh, we'll hear about why that may be possible. And, um, we'll, you know, I don't know how long the rover would, would survive down there, maybe mm-hmm. a few months. Uh, that would, mm-hmm. you know, but you know we tend to we tend to <laughs> underestimate these things. Look, you know, uh, opportunity is still going <sighs> after almost eleven years. Uh, so the uh, on the surface of Mars now Mars is actually more benign, but still uh, pretty, pretty yeah. tough place to for a machine to to survive. But uh, even even tougher for a human. Even tougher for a human. So we're going to cover that now. One now, if you look on our, if you go to our um, our page, wowsignalpodcast.com, dot click on the the tab that says Threads. I've start, I've established this page recently, so you so people can easily find their way around through the episodes we've done. We have a number of threads listed. We have SETI, astrobiology and exoplanets, SETA, the Fermi paradox, the future of humanity, and X risks, uh, space exploration and development, only two episodes. So we gotta, we have to do better there. And interstellar space flight, no episodes. That's one of our threads. So mm. one Uh-oh. of the, one of the areas we really need to beef up in, in 2015 is interstellar flight. Uh, and I thought we might begin, get our feet wet with a few bursts that explain why interstellar flight is hard. And uh, these would be purely, you know, purely a bit of of physics education, astronomy education, and would be for people who don't appreciate the complexity and the the difficulty of the problem. And, you know, because you might easily say, well, look, Voyager's headed to another star system. Uh, Why can't we just, (laughs) And that was that was, that was launched a long time ago. Why can, why can't we do a lot better than that? And and well, okay, that's a that's a fair question. Let's 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 take that apart and see why uh, why it's difficult and what's involved and why some people think it's going to take a hundred years or more before we can do it. And before we can, before we have the technology to be able to do it, you mean? Right. Yeah. And, right. and this plays into a lot of things, including the Fermi paradox. Is how hard is it to do interstellar spaceflight? It's um, hard. Well, yeah. From, from our perspective, it looks really hard. And what are, what are the obstacles? And will a society, if it reaches a certain point, consider that to be not such a hard problem and take it on? And we don't know the answers to those questions. And we don't know how anthropocentric our answers will be if we do come, come to them. But they are, they are questions I think we should be asking. The purpose of these questions, of course, is to stimulate thinking and analysis and experimentation and trying things. And from that, we'll we'll get answers, not from sitting around speculating. But uh, with, with I, that- I have to I have to throw in just uh, like as the sort of closing on the idea of of interstellar space travel, it, that the, a possibility does exist, and that it was sort of the thing depicted in the movie Interstellar, which was a long film, and that's the Alcubierre drive, that which is uh, just hypothetical math, really. And yeah. Michael Alcubierre doesn't believe in it yeah and yet (laughs) there are people like dr harold white at nasa's eagle works who are pursuing that that direction yes Uh, there's um there's a really good episode of the titanium physicist podcast where they delve into that and explain why it's really really difficult to do that uh, way, way beyond our current technology, and, way, 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 and maybe, way, way, maybe way, way, way beyond anybody's technology ever. Maybe ever. Uh, so, uh, because it just—I mean, it's just crazy the numbers you come up with. So, uh, you know. But the advantage, but the advantage of that is being able to move from one place to another. Oh like, yeah, like, that's the thing. You don't have to actually have to push anywhere. You just right. are one place, and then you are another. Right. Well. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's that's uh, 
you know, it's one of these things that physics allows for, mm -hmm. but to do it, at least in the that way Al Kibier described is, is, um, impractical. Yeah. Almost borderline impossible. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, Just so the energy requirements. The energy and, and you know, yeah, creation of negative energy, which is hypothetical. Uh, well, we know how to do it in principle, but it's just uh, it's just crazy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're probably we probably haven't hit on the right right idea yet. Um, but that's what we're gonna we're gonna go into that and lots of other things. In fact, I want to get um, some of these folks on, and we'll talk about after we after we've explained why it's hard. And why we can't just uh, put a you know put something on a on a big rocket and launch to another star? With, Push it there. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. We can. And we'll talk about some of the wrinkles in that too. I mean, Duncan. For we actually already talked about Duncan Forgan's idea of using uh, wrinkle clo time. close flybys of of stars. What's what's a reasonable time to get to another star? Is a thousand years? One hundred years? Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll bat those ideas around quite a bit. With, and there's another interesting point. Like we haven't really, we haven't had anything that sort of, we don't have, haven't built anything that durable that can travel in space for a hundred years successfully. That was, that's another key component. No, we haven't. Key challenge. Uh, that, but that, you know, that's the sort of thing that sounds like a, a possible engineering challenge. Uh, it's, it's not be, it doesn't, it doesn't make anybody say, what are you crazy? It just makes people say, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, those kinds of things, uh, you know, we, we've taken on some pretty difficult things before and, have, and have successfully, to, uh, accomplish them. But there are some things that just are physically, you know, they're, they're pushing the physics so far that they, they become infeasible. Uh, but I'm not, we're not going to rule anything out a priori as, as long as it's uh, it's not too crazy, and that's that's why I like Icarus Interstellar. That's why I work with them is because yeah. that they talk about this stuff from a scientific vantage point, n not not with a unobtainium or a, a, a imaginarium or whatever th those materials are called, but with, with I mean they they started with the footing of the Project Daedalus. Which was the, from the British Interplanetary Society in the seventies. Then, the, then Project Icarus was the reanalysis of that material in the two thousands because we've had so much scientific updates since in, in that period between the seventies and the and the two thousands. They updated. If we had to go to a an, another star system, how would we go about doing it? And that's what that's what essentially what Icarus Interstellar works on, which I think is. A, a terrific, a terrific um, puzzle, a little problem. It's a fun problem set. Yeah, and there are a number of organizations: There's Icarus Interstellar, which I know you're associated with, and and uh, 100 Year Starship, 100 Starship, and the Tau Zero Foundation. Tau Zero. And, and if you're really interested in this stuff, um, Paul Gilster at Centauri Dreams, sure, he does a fantastic job on writing about it. Yeah, I, I read that. Um, I love that blog. So yeah, we, th those are all people we'd like to have on and, and have them share their vision and their sense of where the real challenges are. Uh, and, and, you know, it's really interesting. Think, think about the people that are involved, interested in interstellar space science. I mean, since it's so far off in our future, there's, if just, if we just look at where we are right now, mm -hmm. when the time when we will be applying ourselves to interstellar space exploration is no time soon. We'd have to have some significant breakthroughs. All right, I to, agree. I agree with that. It's, it's right. So the, the the people that are working on this are really interesting. They're 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 nerdy in a whole cool kind of way. It just mm. that isn't ordinary. Well, this they're this different. yeah this tie this is going to tie into um this summer. There's an important event which is. The flyby of Pluto by the New Horizons spacecraft. That that we need to cover. Um, that's so exciting. We need to find an angle to cover that that's different from different from just the usual sort of press release sort of journalism. And we will. I'm hoping actually to get Alan Stern himself on the man himself, uh, who's behind who the man who really made New Horizons happen. 
back many years ago. And he's still the, the PI. He's quite a dynamo. He's involved in no, quite a, a number of projects, and I'd love to have him on, including Golden That's Spike. That's a good one. Did you, you, know, you know the uh, the New Horizons probe has an ounce of, of uh, Clyde Tombaugh's ashes I on did, the yeah, spacecraft? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. The, uh, the guy who discovered Pluto in 1930? Yes, yes. And he was actually... I mean, that's pretty cool. He actually, before he died, he was he was officially on the New Horizon science team. Uh, you know, kind of an honorary position, but because he had retired at that point. But uh, Well, that's going to raise a lot of, a question on people's mind. Well, we can send something to the last, what do you want to call it, a planet or an ice dwarf or whatever you want to call planet, it. Planet, microplanet, yeah. Well, if you ask Alan Stern, it's a, it's a damn planet. <laughs> He'll, he'll be very emphatic about that. It's a planet. Uh, and so I'm not said, getting involved in that discussion. We can call it Pluto. Uh, I, I'm just going to call it Pluto. Uh, in fact, I'm hoping to avoid that controversy because I, I, I think it, it wastes a lot of energy. But um, that, that must be. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, well, Alan Stern has been heavily involved in that controversy, and, and he will. He has his own views on it, which are. Well, which he, I, mean, he, the quite good. I mean, the argument is pretty good. I mean, do astronomers say it's a planet or do do planetary scientists decide if it's a planet or not? And that's well, a, I like that argument. Yeah. You know what? I, I let, Let's not go there. <laughs> uh, there are, I like how some people call it a, plut- a plutoid, though. That's pretty funny. That's a good that's a good teachable moment to show the relative scale of, of things. You know, Pluto's about 30 astronomical units out, and uh, which is, you know, pretty far, about what roughly 45, I'm sorry, four and a half, five billion kilometers away from the sun. Um, nowhere near as far as the nearest stars, and we can we can we can make that argument very. Very forcefully, then, because there'll be a lot of attention on on New Horizons, um, and so uh, those are those are two areas that we we need to really hit hard, which is exploration and uh, interstellar travel, and the ideas and the visions and the concepts for interstellar travel. Uh, we're not going to leave you with any solid answers about that just a lot more questions and you know what the questions are is really where where we hope to be able to to create some clarity uh just as we did with the asteroid episode where we talked to a real a real asteroid scientist about uh what the real problems and threats are and not just you know what what something somebody made up to scare people but what he left us with was Here's the research we need to do. Here's what we need to, the answer, questions we need to answer. Here is the observations we need to make. You know, not don't worry, the asteroid won't hit you, but rather, you know, we don't know of any asteroids that are going to hit you, and and uh, we sh- we need to know more about more, the rest of the asteroids. And here's how we can do it. And and that's the kind of thing that um, that we want to do with interstellar travel. We want to say we don't we don't know what. We don't even know if our species will ever go to another star. But here's the here are the questions and problems we will face if if we try to do that. And you know, right, right. And uh, so that that's that should, that could be a lot of fun. We could I, I envision that's probably about three ma- three big episodes and several bursts. Um, the other one is we want you to. Know, I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Another interesting subject uh, you and I have discussed in the past is longevity. Right. And, and that, that sort of ties in with interstellar space. Yes, it does. Since it takes so long. Yeah. And, and then uh, um, I had mentioned to you before uh, da, uh, Dr. Martin Rothblatt. Yes. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. And Martin Rothblatt is big. She's big proponent of transhumanism, big proponent of longevity. And longevity studies, rather. And in fact, uh, a friend I've I've known Martin for a couple years. We met at a, a 100 year Starship Symposium a few years back, and and Martin and I had a friend who who passed recently. My 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 good friend Mike Chodes and he died. 
Yeah. One of the things I talked to Martine Rothblatt was preserving a friend of mine who was dying. And she had suggested that I contact this cryogenics company in the United States. And you, you know what? It's really affordable to have your brain freezed, cryogenically sustained. Oh. And it was terribly cheap. It, it was for a person who has means. It's not like it, it, I think it was I think it was two hundred thousand dollars total to have your brain preserved. Which if you're into that sort of thing, it's certainly a possibility. It was a little unnerving to me once I gave contemplation to that that path. But there's other options. I mean, people are are. I mean, every day we're breaking down um, cellular processes, and and there's so many people really pursuing longevity as the continuation, the answer to extending humankind throughout the solar system and universe and galaxy, rather. Yeah, I really did want to explore that last year, and we never got around to it. There's there are several experts in that area who who I would think we could talk to. Um, uh, you know, I was, uh, who was I? I was over at, um, University of California, San Diego, uh, Freeman, Freeman Dyson was explaining, I was at a conference there. Freeman Dyson was explaining his concept of these seed ships, which was, which are just basically carrier ships that carry DNA and breed human beings, re- regenerate human beings and regenerate a, a humankind. And you know, start with the basic materials, and then and then send it to places that we anticipate have a high likelihood of being receptive to a human presence and rebuilding the human race. And I mean, there's there, he, that's another way of doing it. Yeah, and that technology, although we don't have it now, it, it's is sort of a, a, you can see it on the distant horizon. Yeah, it's within reason for sure. Um, Cloning. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're we're getting almost to the point where where stem cells are are going to enter mainstream mm-hmm. therapy, and you know mm-hmm. that's going to lead to a whole lot of new research. So, um, yeah. And then we're going to have a lot of people who are, who live a lot longer. Yeah, longevity is important. I mean, if you think about interstellar flight, we we talk about a long flight or a short flight versus you know, scale to a human lifetime. Well, what if a human lifetime is a thousand years? Or, or what if there is no such thing as a human lifetime? What if it's just essentially another? Human? Yeah, another way, you know, uploading personalities to computers. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, then you could send the person at the speed of light. Right, the, the, pretty much. The, the spacecraft could take it could take its sweet time, and then when it gets there, uh, you upload it. And that would be extremely interesting. Um, there, there are also some things that I think we can understand pretty well now with our current knowledge. Uh, I had Daniel Carton on last year to talk about his his uh, analysis of the fermi paradox he's also done an analysis of how long a starship has to be able to travel to be able to propagate a a, a network of colonies I mean, what you might call an empire but although it's really not that but um and it turns out it wasn't that far and he uh, i didn't really get him to explain his analysis but i think like, we could have him back on to explain that you know how why why does yeah, we'll we'll uh, we're definitely going to explore that in longevity, and uh, as we did in episode three of season one, we'll talk more about transhumanism and posthumanism, and uh, and as we did with Robin Hanson, we'll talk about how our li- our future lives will interact with artificial intelligence, and there's a lot of different scenarios there, none of which none of which is particularly. Uh, taken the lead yet in terms of what seems most likely so uh we you know what re- i'd like to have a back is uh is heath Rezebeck, who was he's he he's he's not you know specifically one talent or the other he's very much into longevity he's very much into long now thinking and he's very he's very familiar with interstellar space exploration he works with with um uh, what's his name? 
as long now. Not William Gibson, Stuart, Stuart Brand. Brand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and those guys are always doing interesting things. That long, long now clock project, for instance, the 10,000 year clock. Right. I, I like that kind of stuff. It, it just to have, just to inspire people to just inspire us to think in those directions. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, the, we, we could have him back on as, as often as you like. I mean, just call cool. him up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing that, that I mean, as we've discussed before, you know, one way the team can create content is simply by calling people up and recording the, the conversation. Uh, and <laughs> And then, you know, we can take it from there. And it could be a five minute conversation or a five hour conversation. It doesn't really matter. We can, we can do something with it. Uh, so the, a lot of podcasts are just nothing but conversations, but we want to, we want to make sure that we have some real information being exchanged. But, sure. uh, yeah, but I think we can, we understand, everybody understands that. We can, and we, that's what happens. I thought your first interview with Heath was, uh, was a really good one. And, uh, made it. We paired that with the Robin Hansen, which was completely different. But I thought it was a, a kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, it was. It was. It. I, I thought I agree with you. Yeah, Hansen is a brilliant guy. Uh, very controversial. We might have him on again to talk about some other things. Uh, he's he he can make people mad, <laughs> and uh, he's written a lot of really interesting things. So I I might have him on again at some point. Do you know Robert Zubrick? Zubrin? Zubrin. I went to one of his talks once. I mean, speaking of being able to make people mad. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You either love him or hate him, I think. Or, or, <laughs> Some people really hate him, man. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. He, he's uh, he's had he's, a number of things that he's done that have been interesting. Yeah, he's passionate about his subject, and, and uh, sometimes I think that passion pushes a little farther than the the science can carry but i think his science is really good well I, yeah i wouldn't mind having him on and we could talk about mars or we could talk about whatever he wants to talk about um i know he's also been interested in alternative energy and and um he's been interested in how we can make you know how we can control uh autom- automotive emissions uh so uh the uh the Mars thing uh, is getting very hot these days. Oh, I was just going to say that. Isn't it interesting how how really into Mars people are? Right. Well, I think you know we're seeing a lot more of it, and uh, the Curiosity rover, and and you know we're seeing complex, interesting things on the surface that indicate that that it had an interesting past. So. Uh, it fires up the imagination a little bit. And then people say, well, you know, if we're going to be a multi-planet civilization, that's pretty much our other planet right there. And yeah. uh, Venus may be in the very, very far future. We oh. could, we, we could, ter- <laughs> we could, we could terraform it, but it, you know, it's, it's not ever going to be as big a deal as Mars. And, you know, you, you could colonize dang near anything. If you really, <laughs> You had the technology and you wanted to do it badly enough. Um, the, uh, you know, you could, you could, there's just, there's really, the limit is only the imagination, but uh, in terms of what can be done in the next few generations, it's, it's Mars. And every, I think people are starting to recognize it's that, Mars. that we want to be a multi-planet, uh, space multi-planet fair. species species spacefaring civilization yeah space and yep that, that you know the and, cool thing about mars for me yes. the cool thing about mars for me is that we can we can realistically do space elevators like i would never put space elevators here on planet mayhem because people blow stuff up so much that it it's just too big a target for these for the crazy monkeys uh, yeah, and, yeah and the, that is a problem. And the rest of us suffer. Yeah. So, but on Mars, on a new planet, we can we can do a, a space elevator. Makes sense. Um. Yeah. Uh. 
there there's a that 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 would be something to look at. Yeah, I haven't given it much thought myself, I, but the whole range of Mars exp, uh, Mars colonization architectures is still to me very much up in the air uh, because we still haven't solved right. the problem of how just oh, to absolutely. get people there and <laughs> have them survive indefinitely. Uh, yeah, yeah. People don't understand the the physical challenges of Mars. It, we think it. I mean, when people say we go there and then we terraform it and build atmosphere and make it warm. Uh, well, that's not I mean, going to happen quickly. Certainly, uh, that would happen. That would no, happen. that would be no. that would be uh, generations away. Uh, after, so after even land. just to go there, day with the temperature and the atmosphere. And the pressure, it's it's just real cha- real serious challenges. Yes, it is. Um, and uh, but it's kind of the low hanging fruit of the solar system, nevertheless. So, or it's maybe, I like the I like the moon. I'm a big fan of the moon. Well, the moon's fine, except that it doesn't seem to have a whole lot. Well. It, ha- it has some advantages and, d- and some disadvantages. I think we could, um, you know, w- we'd have a better shot at, at getting a, an Earth-like environment on Mars eventually. And that's probably mm-hmm. where we're going to be. Okay. I mean, I think it's going to ha- – originally the, the thinking was go to the moon first and then go to Mars. I think th- people are now saying we're going to kind of do that reverse. And, and I – you know, I'd like to hear. I'd like to hear different views of that. The, the architecture of these things. I think what's going to happen is is with people like Elon Musk and Mars One and and uh, planetary resources. It's not going to be a big top down c- centrally planned by NASA or by anybody else type of of architecture. It's going to be different pieces coming and dovetailing together. Uh, more like an ecology than like a machine. And uh, there will be mistakes made and there will be lives lost and there will be all kinds of other problems. But uh, that that's the messy way that we humans move into new environments. It's not, it's, it's never. I, so. If, if we, if I, if, if we had a, a big mall of people living at the bottom of, of the ocean at a considerable, considerable death, then I would be more likely to believe in the possibility of a Mars colony. But we have, we can't even have, we, you know, we haven't had people live underwater for any extended period of time. Well, we can, and there's we some, know. there's yeah. some, and, and for a month. Yeah. Or, or even longer, but, uh, you have to have a compelling reason to stay down there. <laughs> and there's, that, that's that's the yeah, that's what we're lacking right to now. Live on Mars. Well, yeah, okay, no, no, that would be, uh, and I think you'll see that. I think once people are very serious about going to Mars, I think you'll see more of that kind of thing. You know, you have the desert, the uh, the Mars desert. Um, I can't remember what they call it. The Arctic. There's an Arctic or desert experiment where they they have people go out and sort of simulate being on Mars for extended periods of time. Uh, and they found that it's pretty hard, you know, but that's what you need to do that kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, well, I have a friend who does it, a uh, cyan Porter. She was a NASA astronaut candidate and now she's moved on to the, do these things. She's in her forties. So she's still a, a candidate for future NASA mission missions, but she does these Mars, um, what do they call them? Parallels or or uh, uh, analogs? Bio analogs. Thank yes. you. Yeah, Mars analogs. Yeah. Well, I I think that yeah. you'll see a lot of that. And we've had you know that we should we should the the uh, um, we should see it we should see that at the at the at the on the coldest places on the hottest places we should the most difficult places to live on Earth we should have these things where and make it look easy. When we can make it look easy, then we're ready to go to Mars. Well, there are people that have been wintering over in Antarctica for a long time, but um, that that's probably the harshest 
uh, above above ground environment on Earth, and uh, but they basically just stay indoors most of the time. Uh, but they don't have to be self sustaining. They don't. They they know that plane is going to show up eventually with more supplies. So uh, and there's there's no chance of doing any kind of agriculture right. there. So the, the trick is going to be some kind of self sustaining um, colony. Uh, that can, doesn't have to be dependent on yeah. cargo flights. And I, I think that's, that's not an easy problem. Yeah. And, but I don't think, no. I don't think there's anything there that's a real technological challenge, uh, you know, in terms of we need exotic technology to get there. We just need to solve the engineering problems and spend the money, which is why I think Elon Musk is, is okay. very, such an optimist on it. And, it is. And, and you know, uh, okay, so for me, the, the the way to solve all of this is to be able to get to space easy. And since we can't get to space easy, to make that hundred mile jump from Earth to space, it, simply make it simple, easy, affordable, and non not as poisonous as it is right now, because rockets uh, are really poisonous. Well, and I mean, even though they've gotten to be what they call green, but it's still very bad for everyone well the they're, they're mostly the burning thing. kerosene and if we had to do that a lot it would have a, a big impact yeah so we have to be able to get up to space simply fast and be able to carry many people a, 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 and supplies to build space stations in order to build materials to go to mars i mean we, we we have to have space stations to go to mars i don't think we just launch from earth to go to mars i think we have little in in between points well, I don't know if you need a space I'm not station. The, I didn't invent that idea. I don't know if you need a space station, although I know that some people are big on that. I, but I love space stations. The, the, the problem you get into is... I love them. Uh, yeah, well, uh, they tend to be a, a huge cost. I want, a, which, I want a space mall. Yeah. Well, uh, so does Bob Bigelow. So <laughs> you, might, you might get one. Plenty of room. Yeah, uh, the the problem. Yeah, the problem is is basically the cost of of the uh, initial boost off off the planet, and yeah, I don't think that's gonna. Yeah. There's gonna be a magic bullet there. I think we're just gonna work it down slowly, uh, and uh, get it if we can get it down just a just a little from where it is now. Things get a lot more feasible. It doesn't have to be you know. Do you know the price? Do you know the price per pound right now? Uh boy, it's been a long time since I've done that, but I think it's probably uh, with SpaceX, it's probably dropped from about ten thousand dollars a kilogram in geo. Well, see, see, I used to work in geo, so I knew the geo price, but I'd, I'd have to go back and do the arithmetic for Leo. Um, it's probably down to uh, a few thousand per kilogram in Leo. Um, if you take a Falcon nine, um, but I, okay. I, I'm looking at it right here. The, uh, uh, price for a he- heavy he- Falcon, heavy launch, 83 million. And that payload will be able to carry to Leo 117,000 pounds working out to $709 per pound, less than the 1000 per pound. Yeah. BTE gold well, for the heavy lifter. Yeah. So, you, well, yeah. So yeah. I breaking mean, the $1,000 per pound launch cost. Yeah, I think well back back in the seventies we were told the shuttle was get us to five hundred dollars uh, a pound. It never, of course, it didn't get anywhere near that. But uh, <laughs> they did a poor job of that. <laughs> well, that was that was over promising. It's not so much that they under delivered; they over promised. Uh, I mean, the shuttle. If if I, if we had to do it again, I'm sure we would do a very different sort of of system. Um, but yeah, the yeah, and, and you know part of that was was what they could sell to Congress, and how the, how to sell it to Congress, and not so much whether Absolutely. it was good engineering or not. Yeah. So, um, the yeah, I think we need to get you know we need to get to where for every every and we need I I'm not I haven't been a while since I've done this analysis, but. Every you know, few hundred bucks per kilogram you can shave off. There's tremendous revolution in what you can do, and 
we're getting right. down to the point where we may be down to less than a few hundred bucks per kilogram. Uh, and then, you know, we're not there yet, but uh, what they're trying to do at SpaceX with reusable first stages is certainly a step in that direction if they can make that work. And so far, I think, you know, they're pretty close in spite of mm-hmm. the problems they had uh, a couple days ago. Still very promising. Um, the, uh, but they're, they're going to have to do some more. Have some and more and the problem that, that, that the, the landing that they had the other day, the, the at sea landing, uh, that, that was, they didn't anticipate that that was going to go anywhere. They, they, no, excuse me. They didn't anticipate that they were going to succeed at that. That was, well, they thought it was about expert. a 50, 50 chance, but and the, that's some heavy odds, man, but a hundred percent chance you're going to learn something, which is really what, what they were aiming at. And they did. I'm sure they learned a yeah. lot. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, uh, that, that was, that was a, a very, um, I think that's going to be a big success. I think that, um, but that's not going to take us all the way down to where we'd like to be. It's going to, we're going to need to do some other things. I think ultimately it's a question of not launching a whole lot of weight, but when you get to Mars, uh, you you take as much of the in situ resources as you can and, and make as much of them as you can. Uh, that's going to be important. I think everybody kind of agrees that just to, to some extent we need to do that. And um, I, I know right. Bob Absolutely. Zubrin. Bob Zubrin was big on that for a long time ago. You know, uh, so you know, turning his idea was to turn the CO two into rocket fuel. Uh, and it's still. I mean, that's that's what people say about living on the moon. That's just, and and that's what I mean. That's what I say. Using the asteroids for that's infinite, infinite supply of fuel and resources, a nearly limitless supply of fuel and resources. Yeah, well, those that, are those are advantages to be had that are just a hundred miles out of our reach. Yeah, we're definitely doing because getting uh, off the planet. Yeah, and that reminds me, we're definitely doing an episode on asteroid mining uh, soon. I would think in a couple months we're going to do one. Uh, and cool. Dr. Galache has uh, agreed to come back on and talk about what he knows. And we're hoping to get somebody else cool. uh, as well. So, uh, you know, we d- we've done one episode on that where we kind of dug into it a little bit, so to speak. But the next step is going to be uh, to dig deeper, to ask more questions about about the kind of architecture we need to really make that successful to make it profitable. Cause once it's profitable, right. I think the, see the part of the part of it is, is as long as we're depending on Congress to fund things or depending on other governments to fund things, we're going to be, we're going to be in this frustration cycle that we've been in for 40 years. And sure. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if you remember the, what was it? The space exploration architecture, uh, you know, the original vision for the space station, lots of other things that have been going on. Um, the, a lot of that got frustrated by just the fact that it costs so much and that you can't get the NASA budget really realistically above a certain level each year, uh, which is uh, not even 1% of the federal budget. But the, uh, you know, it, it's right. I mean, there's just other demands. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the, the frustration we've had with, with some fair, I mean, the, uh, the first Bush administration proposed some pretty bold steps towards space exploration that never happened. Um, some of it got repurposed into other things. Um, but it was just it was simply the cost there wasn't the political will to to spend that much money on it and so if you can't make it happen for so that you know th- this the relatively small amount of money that you have you know a few billion dollars a year uh and each year you've got to get it renewed you've got to get it paid for again uh if you can't make it happen within that small amount you can't do it and that's why it's never happened uh, we we haven't gone to Mars yet. We have we haven't come back to the moon. Um, that and right. So we it's sort of it's it's we sort of need a drastic change of economy 
to make these things happen? Well, we need, I think we need to be less top down and more bottoms up. We need to have uh, not just congressmen and senators who think it's important. We need to have investors who think it's important. And we have people, we have companies now that have huge piles of cash that the government would envy. You know, th- th- these companies like Apple Computer and Google, uh, they have money they're not, they, they don't even know how to spend. That's why Google's gotten in, they've bought Skybox, they've done other things because they just, they, they ran out of things you can do with search engines. <laughs> And, uh, do you know, do you, well, I, I, Google just bought, who, they, didn't they buy Deep Think? That was their largest Europe purchase, Deep Think. Uh, I think it was 242 million. And yeah. that's that AI. AI is a really interesting. AI is, yeah. And Google's, yeah, AI is scary. And, and, and uh, Google's getting really into AI. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think they're, they, they're appreciative that, that most AI projects fail, uh, pretty spectacularly, but, <laughs> Um, and have been doing so for a long time, but they yeah, they they fail. They as long as you fail better, <laughs> you know, you, then you're making progress. Um, or fail interestingly because fail in interesting way. Yeah. No narrow AI. Yeah. Narrow AI is doing extremely well. Uh, everybody agrees with that. Hallelujah. You know, the self driving cars, the voice recognition yeah. engines, all that stuff. Yeah. That that good stuff. That is good stuff. It's not general AI. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not replace a human type of capabilities. But, but <laughs> I think us. But uh, yeah, and you know, and that's one you got Google behind self driving cars too. They have so much cash, and so does lot. So does a number of other organizations. You just give them a compelling reason to mine asteroids or to go to Mars. Or to do anything like that, and yes. the money will be there. Yes. You know. Do you know who Armin? Do you know Armin Papazian? I do not. He he, he won the the um, I think it was somebody came up with the Black Sky Thinking Prize, the it, Centauri Prize or something like that. It was two years ago. I uh, I'm not sure who sponsored it, and he won it, and. What in his his he's an economist Cambridge. He re he looked at global economy and and redid it. He created a new model to apply to it. And one of the things he pointed out was that the the weird weird stuff like the U.S. government was was giving the Fed eighty five billion dollars a month, eighty five billion. I think NASA's budget is like twenty billion, eighty five annual. And so that that the U.S. government sort of inventing money, eighty five billion a year, and if uh, excuse me, a month. And he was showing the apply the economics into a space scale or a space application would pretty quickly turn into an alternative model, which would generate a whole different magnitude of economics. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think that's why I think this. that magnitude is is coming even here on Earth, and uh, you know, as Robin Hanson pointed out, you know, we our econo- our economy doubles about every fifteen years, and that that rate of doubling could go to much faster, and you know, okay. and and then at some you know some point, assuming that humans are still in charge, uh, and not not our machines. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a lot of interest in mm-hmm. what you know, putting a colony on Mars is not going to be that huge an expenditure. It might it might be a trillion dollar thing now, but cool. then then it won't be that big a deal. So that's exciting to me. Yeah, um, Mike, I think we're going to wrap it up pretty soon because it's all it's all it's all scale economics. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much every topic we you know we. we this is this is a pretty good worldview of where we have been with Wow Signal Podcast and where we are going with Wow Signal Podcast. Right. Okay, Mike. Uh, any other any further comments or recommendations, suggestions, ideas before we uh, wrap no, it up? You know, if you're a pod, if you're a Wow Signal Podcast listener 
and you're so inclined, it's great to share the podcast that you find interesting on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on Tumblr, on on if you do your own podcast or blog to about anything that the Wow Signal podcast has covered is very much appreciated. We appreciate those backlinks. Right. And uh, we uh, also appreciate any support people give us on patreon.com slash wow signal. And I hope that we will hear from listeners. The number one thing that I want most in, in 2015 is more listener engagement. And with with us about the topics of the show, about the show, and just with each other. Just get to know each other and uh, make some friends. So uh, thanks a lot, Mike. And uh, we did it's not a pleasure. Ha- we did not have the rest of the team with us tonight. Uh, they all had problems and reasons they couldn't uh, be here that were completely legitimate. But uh, but thank they were you. here in spirit. Thank you to James Garrison, Tim Jones, and Jim Cavera who hopefully we'll be hearing from again soon. And I thank you, the listener. This is the Wow Signal Podcast. Season 2, it's January 2015. Bye-bye. The Wow Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Please visit WowSignalPodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.